English as we use it today is generally written with an alphabet. Hang on, hang on. This isn't just a review of kindergarten, I promise. My background would be a lot cuter if it were. There we go. In fact, the Latin alphabet that we use to write English is used widely all over the world. But what if it weren't? Not every language uses an alphabet in its writing system. Think of the hieroglyphics of the ancient Egyptians. That's not an alphabet, that's a semantophonetic writing system, where characters can represent a sound or a meaning or both. It's in the name. Semanto, or semantic, refers to meaning, and phonetic refers to sound. And actually, a lot of early writing systems were the semantophonetic type, though these days it's pretty uncommon. Somehow, though, Chinese managed to hold on, and just like hieroglyphs did, makes use of a character called a logogram, a picture that represents a word or concept, although they can also represent sounds. Pictograms, which are the ones you probably think of when you think of logograms. Simple and compound ideograms, which represent more abstract concepts that might be hard to draw a picture of. Transfer characters, which once meant one thing, but then the word started to mean different things. Loan characters, which once meant one thing, but then people started using that character to mean something else, so they needed new characters for both of them. And the most common type of Chinese character in modern times, phonetic semantic characters, which have elements of both the word's meaning and its pronunciation. So, if English used a semantophonetic writing system, it might look something like this. A great way to get more fibers in your diet is using yarn to floss. Great way is expressed using something similar to an ideogram. This character comes from a thumbs up, meaning good or desirable, and this character gives it a connotation of cleverness. Because here, great doesn't mean colossal or any other sense in which the word is used. It means this is a smart way to increase efficiency. Diet uses a phonetic semantic character. This one meaning dye, like to dye clothes because it sounds similar to the first syllable, plus characters for food and life because diet in this instance means the food you eat in your daily life. Yarn is also phonetic semantic. Yar is expressed with characters for pirate and speech, like yar, swab the deck. And then the semantic part represents a ball of yarn with a phonetic character for n. And finally, Floss is a phonetic semantic character here as well. The vaguely F-shaped character looks like string, and so pulls double duty as the meaning indicator and a slight modification to the phonetic compound, which shows how the rest of the word sounds. Loss. <laughs> uh, that was the entire point of the sentence, I'm not gonna lie to you. Even though semantophonetic systems are pretty uncommon these days, the Chinese system of writing has had a heavy influence on a lot of writing systems throughout Asia, even ones that no longer use a semantophonetic writing system. Modern Japanese uses three different sets of characters. Kanji, which are the logographic characters adapted from Chinese, and hiragana and katakana, which are phonetic systems used to write native Japanese words and loanwords from other languages, respectively. The kana each have a syllabary, which is like an alphabet, but each character represents an entire syllable rather than just one phoneme. One of the very first written forms of a Native American language also uses this. In the 19th century, a Cherokee man named Sequoia decided that his language needed a writing system too, and came up with the whole thing himself. But whether or not the characters used to write Cherokee were influenced by the Latin alphabet or not is highly debated, because the script changed when a typeface was developed to allow the Cherokee language to be printed. Either way, I'm basing mine on Latin letters and smashing them together because it's fun. I have never met anyone with a bigger forehead than me. In this hypothetical system, I used pieces of each letter, but not necessarily in the same places. Because a syllabary doesn't actually require similar sounding characters to look similar. That's reserved more for an abugida, which is somewhere between a syllabary and an alphabet. An abugida places consonants and vowels into separate units, but characters that sound similar look similar as well because they use the same symbols for a consonant. Basically, a consonant symbol is the base for the character, and then the consonant will be modified to indicate what vowel goes with it. It. And these are relatively common even today. For example, here are some Thai words that use the same consonant but have the consonants modified differently for the different vowels that go with them. Gan ban chi, ban, rot sa pot run yai, yai, wi san yi pet, yi, nok hunk, hunk, hok ki nam kang, hok dao mo rana, na, wi sha ka ni da sat, ni. To anyone watching this video who speaks Thai, I'm sorry. Anyway, if English were written with an abugida, it might look something like this. Making pigeon noises is not a sin. It's not.
So here, the vowels, or at least symbols for their sounds, are attached to the consonant. Regardless of the location on the vowel, it can be assumed that the vowel comes after the consonant. One exception to the vowel after consonant rule is here at the end of this first word, making. With a suffix as common as ing, I figured it would have its own character. So to keep it all in one piece, the e before the ng is attached to the ng. There's also no g as part of the ing. Instead, the curve below the n signifies that it's the ng sound instead of the n sound. This circle here indicates silence before the vowel, acting as a sort of consonant on its own. Also, in a case like a, uh, our silence consonant will be attached to the word after it, because the vowels can't stand on their own without a consonant. That's not an abogita thing, that's just something I came up with because this is my abogita and I can do whatever I want. Featural writing systems are relatively new compared to the ones that we've talked about so far. It's also kind of controversial whether they're actually in a class of writing systems of their own, but I think they're cool so we're gonna talk about them. Instead of representing an entire phoneme, like letters of the alphabet do, the characters in a featural writing system represent features of those phonemes. In the English alphabet, a C and H together might indicate a ch sound. But in a featural system, the ch sound might have its own character instead of being a combination of two other characters. Because of this, words written in a featural writing system can usually just be sounded right out. One of the oldest and most well-known featural writing systems is Hangul, the modern Korean writing system. Unlike most of the systems we've talked about so far though, Hangul didn't develop over a long period of time. It was made up by one guy, King Sejong the Great, or Sejong Dewang in Korean. Chinese was basically the only writing system in East Asia for centuries. Before the 15th century or so, Korean was written using a Chinese script called Hanja, alongside a bunch of other Chinese-derived phonetic systems. But the complexity of the Chinese script meant that the only people who could make much use of it were scholars and people who could afford to be educated in it. Which meant that the common people kind of just had to do their best with the spoken word. Which meant they couldn't keep records very well and could be much more easily taken advantage of by people in power who could read and write. Then during the Choson dynasty, King Sejong was like, hey, it's kind of uncool how the common people don't get to read and write, and trying to write Korean, but in Chinese, isn't letting us express ourselves very well. I think we need a different system. And he proceeded to invent Hunmin Cheonghum, later called Hangul, which the educated elite did not like at all. They'd spent all this time learning Chinese, only to have a way easier system just come along like that. And more importantly, they couldn't take advantage of poor people as easily anymore. But despite the misgivings of the aristocracy, the rest of Korea took to Hangul eagerly. After all, it's famous for its simplicity, which I'm grateful for because I'm trying to learn Korean right now. They say that a wise man can learn Hangul in a morning and a fool can learn it in the space of 10 days. That does still kind of concern me because it's been way more than 10 days and I'm still mixing up ori with uri. The amount of times that I have tried to sound out a Korean word and it just ended up being an English loan word pronounced with Korean phonetics is more than I would like to admit. <laughs> o tu miul o tu mi oatmeal. Another feature of writing system that I like isn't actually the writing system of a real country, but it's real in my heart. And my D&D games. The Tengwar script from Lord of the Rings. And just like Hangul, it was also invented by just one guy. Fed, I mean, J.R.R. Tolkien. I know reality and fantasy are different things. That's why I play Dungeons and Dragons four times a week. Where Hangul prefers to just make substitutions for sounds it doesn't have, Tengwar has characters for a lot of different sounds. So while it was developed by an elf, it's used to write a variety of languages in the world of Lord of the Rings. That also means it has way more characters than Hangul, but if you're not eschewing simplicity in favor of precision, or at least the aesthetic, are you even a high fantasy elf? Hangul and Tengwar both use similar looking characters for similar sounds, like G and G. K, which are made in the same way in the mouth, but differ in vocalization and the amount of air that's used. In Hangul, they're the same character, but with one more line, and in Tengwar, one more circle. Now, as much as I would love to go off into more specifics about Tolkien's conlangs, we do have one more system to discuss. So here's my quick featural system for American English. Yes, it matters which dialect I wrote it for, because not all dialects of English use the same sounds. And I'm not J.R.R. Tolkien. My goal for this system was to create the simplest shapes I could, with straight straight lines used in consonants and curved lines used in vowels, except for the y sound, which I consider to be a sometimes vowel even though I did group it with the consonants. So our y sound has both curved and straight lines. The abjad. 
for which we don't have to deal with vowels at all, at least writing them. In an abjad, only the consonants are written, and the vowels are just... implied, basically? Okay, some do use marks to show vowels, but those are known as impure abjads. Pure abjads can only write consonants. Which I feel like it's kind of judgmental. I mean, in today's increasingly globalized world, you're probably gonna need vowels. Impure abjads, I know you're doing your best. Keep doing you. The word abjad comes from the first two characters of the original Arabic script, much like how our word alphabet comes from the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha and beta. But the reason I saved this one for last is because we are now going to talk about, arguably, one of the most important writing systems in history. The writing system of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians did not invent writing, but their system is the one that became Greek and Aramaic, as well as a bunch of other systems, but I cannot find two more influential systems than those used to write ancient Greek and Aramaic. Think about it. The Greek alphabet became the Etruscan alphabet became the Latin alphabet, the one used for English today, arguably the lingua franca of the entire world, as well as over 300 other languages. Greek also became the Cyrillic alphabet, and probably even the runes used to write Germanic languages before the Romans showed up. And the Aramaic system became the writing systems for Hebrew, Mongolian, and Arabic, and everything descended from the Brahmi script, including Tamil, Khmer, and Tibetan. Basically, every alphabet in the world I could find is descended from Phoenician, the abjad that started it all. So why do we have vowels now if Phoenician didn't bother with them? If you haven't guessed already, we mostly owe that to the ancient Greeks, because their language was the one that needed vowels to be understood properly. So the Greeks said, hey, what does this mean? La be. That's probably meant for the toolsmith. We sometimes get their orders. I'm pretty sure that says le boue. Do we have customers that far away? We don't even ship that far unless they're willing to pay extra. That says lo bea. We're definitely not shipping there unless one of you wants to stay out there. No, wait. It says le bois. They escaped from there. They're not making a ship there. They probably just want us to be discreet. I'm pretty sure this is a complaint letter. Lo be. See? Maybe it's the opposite. They liked the last order so much they wanted to send us a river of compliments. I think it says lo beau. They're just making fun of us. Throw it away. Hmm. I smeared it. I'll just write la bai there so they know what happened. Now, English as an abjad would pretty much just be English without vowels, which you've already seen if you've listened to Fallout Boy in the last 15 years or so. <laughs> So instead, I came up with some sentences whose meaning changes based on which vowels you add. Okay, sometimes they're sentence fragments. Because it's actually pretty hard. It's kind of a cool language game, though, so if you're ever, like, stuck on a long car ride without internet, let me know if it destroys your brain like it did mine. Same consonants for each word in the same order. I and uh are freebies, obviously, but it's harder than you'd think. However you do it, the most important thing writing gives us is the ability to make and keep an explicit record which has proved so significant in human society that it's literally where history begins. Seriously, even if the exact dates are disputed, the invention of writing is what separates prehistory from history. And can we really be surprised? Most humans, in one way or another, desperately want to leave a legacy. To feel as though the things we did in our life affected the world in some way. That we've left a mark on our little space rock. We can tell stories and dig up fossils and analyze million-year-old bones, but that can only teach us about the bodies of those who came before us. Passing down knowledge by speaking still limits us to those who can hear us and that we can physically speak to aloud, or in the case of sign language, who can see us, but that still changes over time with different speakers and different ways people remember things. Writing lets us know things about our ancestors that we can't physically hold. Their thoughts, their dreams, their desires, their wishes, their feelings. It lets them tell their story in their own words. Lets them cry out from long-lost graves about the things that they wanted, the things that frustrated them, the things and the people they loved. What's more human than the butterflies of new romance, as is spoken of in the earliest known love poem found in Istanbul? Bridegroom, dear to my heart, Goodly is your beauty, honey sweet. You have captivated me. Let me stand tremblingly before you. What's more human than wanting to leave your children with the wisdom you gained with age, in hopes of sparing them the same suffering your mistakes caused you? 
Ptahhotep, an official retiring from the royal court in Egypt, left a ton of advice for his son who was taking over his job. Do not be proud on account of your knowledge, but discuss with the ignorant as with the wise. If you wish friendship to last within a house you may enter, resist approaching the wife. Love your wife within reckoning. Fill her belly, clothe her back, gladden her heart as long as you live. And of course, What's more human than writing a detailed review of a purchase you were very unsatisfied with? Or taking amusement in your ability to scam people with a subpar product? As we see in the infamous complaint tablet to Anatsir. When you came, you said to me, I will give fine quality copper ingots. You did not do what you promised me. You put ingots which were not good before my messenger? What do you take me for that you treat me with such contempt? It is now up to you to restore to me in full. Take notice that I will not accept any copper from you that is not of fine quality. Blushing brides, a wise old man passing his legacy on to his son, scheming merchants and their angry customers, people and events that wouldn't be out of place even in modern times. They're all so ordinary, and I can't help but wonder what else just didn't make it long enough to be discovered. But even these that we have are just miraculous. Words written centuries and centuries ago, still somehow here to tell us how people loved and dreamed and scammed each other out of good quality copper. So wonderfully and hilariously human from so unimaginably long ago. And I'm obsessed with that. Any future archaeologists that come across this, I request a bucket of glitter be placed at my exhibit in the museum. By now you guys have glitter that doesn't make such a mess, right? Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe, follow me on social media, especially on Twitch, where we talk about this stuff all the time, whether I mean to or not. I love debating linguistics while I play Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> if your teeth it. fall out, I want them for magic, because the orthodontist if stole mine. If my teeth fall out, introduce me to the most terrible people you know, so that I can have a tumultuous romantic relationship with them and then write songs about it. I hope you have a wonderful day or night, whatever time it is for you. Stay safe, and I will see you soon.